Well, it was simple, <laughs> other than trying to get AV to work is the non-simple part, I guess. Um, well, thanks very much. I appreciate uh, being invited to kick off this new conference, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, a little bit more about, uh, about sort of me. I, you got a little, uh, you know, the headline, which was that you know, a few years ago, I helped Netflix do cloud-native architecture in particular, the theme of this conference. I've done many talks while I was at Netflix on cloud-native architecture and on uh, microservices and on the migrations and things like that. Um, for the last uh, two, almost two and a half years, I've been working at a venture capital firm, Battery Ventures. And in that role, I'm looking for um, interesting new companies and also interesting new end users, the big companies that are trying to learn these new architectures and learning how to scale and learning how to uh, build out new style systems and figuring out what does their technology stack look like and how can we engage with them. So if you're a developer, if you're working at a, a startup, I'm interested to hear about that and what you're working on. And if you need money, <laughs> we're a VC firm, we invest in people. Um, uh, but also if you're a large end user and you've got some interesting problems and you're evaluating lots of different products, um, you know, open source projects or, or uh, project products from companies. Very interested to know what those are. So I'll be around um, probably you know, all the rest of today and most of tomorrow and um, just happy to, to engage. I also spend a lot of time giving talks, internal talks at companies. So um, you know, if I'm around uh, wherever you're based, I can, I can drop in, um, but also I can um, do video conferences and things like that. So if you're internally, you're trying to convince your management or your architecture team, okay, this is what a cloud native microservices architecture should look like, I'm happy to spend an hour or two chatting to you about that uh, later on. Okay, so this talk's called It's Simple. Um, and so let's start with an interesting question here. Can you see that? <laughs> All right, this is a fairly complicated Question, right? So what's the answer? Well, it's got a very simple answer. <laughs> so now, if you just say the word 42 near people, they know that that's the answer to this incredibly complicated question. So it's become a, a little reference point. It's a shorthand for this big, long, complicated question. So that's interesting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about things that we see as complicated and things that we see as simple and how, what, what is the real difference in that? Um, because life is obviously very complicated, but we reduce it to simple things uh, and simple abstractions to deal with it. So, the, so the real, what this talk is really about is figuring out what are the abstractions that make your life simple. Right? And how do you find those abstractions? What do they look like? And what are some of the things that we already do which are actually insanely complicated, but we do without even thinking about it? And so when somebody says it's too complicated, what do they really mean? This is kind of what I think. It means there's too many moving parts, and I can't tell what it's going to do next. Right? That's, like, that's what you really th are thinking when you're thinking it's, it's too complicated. Right? But if you, if you spend enough time with something, then you understand the moving parts, and you start to get intuition on how it's going to behave, and things start to look simple. So let's just ask a question. What's the most complicated thing that you can deal with without even thinking about it? Driving. Driving, yeah. So think about that. Just about everybody in society, you expect them to be able to drive a car. Cars are incredibly complicated. Driving across the city is incredibly complicated. There's all the other drivers. If you sort of drop an alien or somebody from a culture that doesn't have cars and you sit them in a car and say, okay, just drive across Stockholm, <laughs> it's insanely complicated. And you can do it while, you know, listening to a podcast, you know, eating something, drinking your coffee, barely thinking, and you just end up where you, at work or wherever, right? So how did, how did that happen? Um, and wh where are, how do we get that level of complexity 
under control so that we get it to just be totally baked into society. If you go back 100 years, cars were complicated. No one knew how to deal with them. You had to have somebody walking in front with a red flag in case it frightened the horses, all of those kinds of stories. Of course, some of us do actually have complicated cars. I, I have a, an old car that, that I take to car shows, and I won a contest. I won this category, the needlessly complicated Italian category, in a, in a, com, in a contest called the Concours de Lemons, which is held in California every summer. That's my wife, and that's my car. Um, the car's a Citroen SM, which isn't actually even an Italian car. <laughs> Um, turns out none of the Italian cars made it to the conference, to the show. They all died or didn't turn up or went somewhere else. And this was the nearest thing they could find, was, an, it was a French car with an Italian engine, and it, and it is actually a needlessly complicated car. It has hydraulic everything, and it's um, amazingly complicated. So we have a lot of fun with this thing, trying to keep this car running and taking it to car shows. It's a 1973 car, and... You know, last time I went to take it for somewhere, actually, its brakes stopped working. So I had to turn around and go back and get a different car. So, you know, we, we do sometimes have things which aren't sort of, you, you have to think about them. They're a little bit more complicated. But the more modern things, people have been working on the interfaces to make it easier and easier and more reliable and more dependable and more predictable. So what's another thing you can think of that's incredibly complicated that you just deal with? Something you can give to your kids. What do your kids spend all their time doing nowadays? Playing iPad. Yeah, playing on iPad. There was a situation, uh, just after the iPhone came out, we were going, oh, we have this amazing new phone, and, and I was standing around with a group of friends at a sort of barbecue, some dinner, you know, standing around somebody's yard with, with drinking, whatever, and somebody was holding his two-year-old daughter, and she mumbled something that didn't even make sense to us. And he got out the phone, gave it to her, and she starts searching YouTube for SpongeBob videos. And the rest of us like jaw drop. This is in 2008, right? Yeah, the iPhone had only been out for a few months. It's like, how could you even do that? How, how does she know how to do that, right? Um, so, if you just if you have any idea how an iPhone actually works, it's insanely complicated. Right, I know it's a little, or iPhone, Android phone, but modern smartphones, there's an incredible amount of technology in the phone and in the networks that support it and in the applications that are on it and in the back-end services that support that. And then you can give it to pre-verbal children and they just reach into it and do things. It's incredible. Right, so there's an abstraction there that works. How do you find those abstractions? Um, of course, if you take somebody's, somebody's phone, and say, let's say you pick up somebody else's phone and it's unusable because they've done this. Like, this is my phone. <laughs> I have all my icons on one page in groups. And you can't find anything because everyone has customized their phone with hundreds of applications in hierarchies and whatever. And so you take something that was simple and now you've turned it back to be complicated again because you've customized it. Now, I know where everything is, but... You know, I pick up my wife's phone and she has, I have to hunt around but just to find where's the Google Maps gone or whatever. And then there's this really interesting book that came out last summer um, from Randall Munro who wrote at XKCD, Thing Explainer. He uses only 1,000 words in the English language, the 1,000 most popular words in the language to explain how things work. And if you look at this, there's all kinds of little boxes in here like a thinking box is the CPU or something like that, right? So he goes through and he explains what is inside a phone in, in, in simple words. So you can actually see some of that complexity. So that's, that's just in our daily life, right? We've got incredibly complicated things that we've figured out how to use and they've become baked into society as simple things. And some of them have a bit more friction, like learning to drive is a complicated thing, right? You have to pass tests. But then you get to the iPhone where you just you give it to somebody that has you can't even explain what this thing is to them and they intuitively figure out how to use it. So that's a whole other level of intuition that makes it easy to deal with. So that's, that's in our own lives. So let's think about work. How do we simplify our work, how, where we, you know, the, the, the jobs we do? And uh, obviously at Netflix, we're, we're well known for this culture. Um, and there's a book, that, a, a presentation that was put out in 2009, which now has million, you know, tens of millions of views on, on SlideShare. 
a freedom and responsibility culture. And you know, as this comment from, from Sheryl Sandberg, one of the most important documents ever to come out of the Valley, it's been hugely influential on company cultures around the world. And if you're trying to start a company, the, the, one of the real lessons here is you can only really set a company culture when you're small. Once you get big, you can destroy culture, but it's very hard to create culture. One of those things like trust, it's very asymmetric. If you're starting small, be very intentional about your, class, your culture. Don't wait until the company gets to a few hundred people before you start, being, start thinking about the culture you want. Be very intentional, very early, and that sets, up, sets you up for a successful uh, way of thinking. So why is this related to simplicity? Well, here's, here's one, one slide from this deck. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Right? So you're setting a goal. Right? We want this thing. Don't, and they, let everyone figure out the details themselves of how they get there. Right? As long as everyone is yearning for the vast and endless sea, you will end up with a boat. <laughs> you don't have to tell them to build a boat. A boat will magically appear out of the collective behavior of the people who have the goal. Um, you know, Netflix is basically, its goal is to be the sort of the future of, enter of video entertainment, right? And all the things needed to get there on a global basis are just details which don't need to be planned in fine grain and imposed from above. They are, you know, everyone understands what the goal of Netflix is and they can go figure out how to do it. One interesting thing, um, The Little Prince, this is a French book by, I can't even pronounce his name, Antoine de saint os exupery I don't know. Um, <laughs> I should probably practice that. Um, Netflix just licensed a video of that book to be on Netflix sometime. <laughs> so you'll be able to watch, um, uh, it's, a, it's a little sort of science fiction-y story, but this is one of the elements of it. So if you're building out a company and you're trying to create these really purpose-driven companies, then, you know, why doesn't everyone do that? Well, the problem is what we have in, in the world is a lot of big companies, big enterprises, where as you get large groups of people, you basically, there's, at some point, your ability to trust everybody starts to go down because you're organizing very large groups of people, and you have to set up rules and processes that are basically for running low trust organizations. You can see organizations like Netflix as high trust organizations across the whole organization, which is now a few thousand people. It's one of the largest collectively high trust organizations out there. And one of the reasons they're able to do that is they're all in one location, pretty much. Uh, so engineering's in one location. Um, they have um, a lot of internal sharing of, of information and then they have only one product they're trying to build. So there's very little internal conflict. They're, just, you know, they're not trying to do you know, thousands of other different types of things. A lot of companies keep adding product lines. Netflix has a single service it's trying to produce. I mean, there's a lot of complexity behind that, but that is deliberate. It's so that everyone's going for the same goal. Right? So once you have that simplifying things, you can actually scale the company to be fairly large. But in most of the time, you end up with small groups of trusted people who have low internal complexity. They know how everything works. It's keep it simple. And then you have interfaces between them. But the problem with this is that as soon as you put process, as soon as you write down how you want to do something, it starts to drive away talent because you're now saying, okay, we're going to not trust anybody, we're going to assume you're all stupid, and we're going to just say everyone has to do it this way. You all have to use this tool. You all have to use this language. You all have to follow this release process uh, because we don't trust you to know a better way of doing it. And you start going to the lowest common denominator. And what happens then is some of your best people will just leave and go somewhere else where they can uh, do whatever they want to do, but probably try to find a new, better way of doing things. And somebody once asked me, well, you know, I was telling them about the, all, all our architecture, and said, well, we can't do that because we don't have the talent that Netflix has. And I said, well, we hired them from you. 
that's, that's where we go. We didn't sort of ma we don't have all the vats where we breed, you know, manufacture Netflix engineers. They were all very senior people who'd worked everywhere in the industry. And the reason they'd ended up as Netflix was we got out of their way. We let them build a system that evolves. And the, the, the thing is here, we're not just building the best practice system. We're not saying, I, mean, I see this mistake sometimes. People say, oh, what's, how did Netflix do it? Okay, let's copy that. Like, let's copy the tools. Let's copy that process. That's obviously the best practice. Let's write that down and make that our standard. Right? That's, you're actually missing the point. You're seeing a process as an artifact of a system that's evolving. Netflix is evolving continuously. And what they've done is they built a system that's designed to evolve. And at any point in time, it has a bunch of things that look like processes. But they're really just artifacts of, of the way you're looking at it. Right? And that, there's an underlying simplicity in the systems thinking approach that they use. And then what looks like a complicated mess of, of ad hoc processes on top are actually being driven by this system. So there's, I talked a bit about systems thinking. There's a, there's a really good book on this. Um, by Jamshid Gaharajade. Um, I'm having to practice his name because I'm going to meet him this summer. <laughs> um, I got invited to a, to a to conference he's running. Um, purposeful systems representing the systems for your development. So we're talking about purposeful systems, like having a clear purpose for your team, right? Assumes plurality in all three dimensions. So that means that you're assuming that there isn't one way of doing things. Things are allowed to evolve. We're trying to build companies and products that are designed to evolve rather than designed to be best in class or whatever. They're designed to be continuously evolving. Which means that once you get the system thinking right, it's very hard to tie it down. If, as soon as it's a, assuming plurality means that you're allowing things to have multiple functions, you're allowing things to have multiple processes. As soon as you tie something down to a single process or a single function or a single structure, you're actually freezing it and you're preventing it from evolving. Right? So this, this is why it's uncomfortable to a lot of people to go to a systems thinking because they're used to, okay, what do I do next? I don't have the rules to follow. You have to step back and put yourself into the mindset of the system and figure out what the next step is. So this is a different way of working. What it comes down to is these systems are simple and flexible and very adaptive and they evolve. And when you write down everything in rules, it, it gets increasingly complicated as you try to specify everything and it gets increasingly rigid. Okay. So most, how many people have a, an a HR manual, like a company manual, in a binder or on their cube, like a big fat ring binder, and every now and again you have to go on training on how to you know, do expenses right or something like that. You know, that's pretty common, large company stuff. Netflix doesn't have that manual. They have one phrase, act in Netflix best interest. If you can remember that phrase, you are then completely up to speed with all HR training. <laughs> that's it. Uh, that's the expense policy, that's the policy for everything. And if you don't have good enough judgment to interpret that phrase to your current situation, then we don't want you working here. <laughs> so what you end up with is a high trust organization where an, every, you assume that everyone has good judgment and can show you that judgment. and means you're, everyone is holding themselves to a very high standard because they know that they are being trusted and they are being, they are being held to this, this uh, high, high standard of judgment. So it's a bit like being on a sports team, you know, where everyone in the team has a piece to play and somebody you know, passes a ball to you and you have to be in the right place to catch it. And you, you, know, you know they're trusting that if they pass the ball to you, you're going to do the best you can with that and not just be kind of, you know, Run around, you know, get it, get it, screw it up, and go in the wrong direction, or or whatever, right? So, the the key thing here is that it's mo it's not a family of culture; it's more like a sports team. And you look at the players in your team, and you say, okay, here's here's some weak spots, here's some people we need to bring in, and you always want to steal the best people from the other sports teams who are who you're playing against, 
Right? So that's, that's the mentality for this culture. Now that culture works for companies like Netflix, who are fairly small and are sitting in the middle of the Bay Area in their talent pool there, where they can, and they pay very well and they try to find the best people. It doesn't work so well if you're, um, say, running a large government department where you can't lay people off because government departments don't do that and you have just the talent you've got. So what I'm seeing there is actually some interesting, I mean, but these organizations also want to move faster and they want to build in these kind of new ideas. So what we're seeing is the formation of small cells of people, like a small group of people who internally have high trust and know what they're doing and own something. And then they have APIs between those teams. So let's talk about the things we build. And I'm just going to go straight to, to Conway's law. Because what I just described is a, a small cellular organization where a group of people with high trust build a thing. And then there are many of these groups. And they connect to each other over APIs or interfaces or agreements, which are relative to the, the, bound, the boundaries of trust. Like, I commit to you that I will take, you know, 10,000 requests a second against this API and it will return in half a second and, and I'll be up so much of the time, right? That is a trust level, an explicit trust commitment is that, you know, and your API will evolve with some discussion over some time and you will be compatible for some period of time. Those kinds of discussions don't tell you anything about the internal, the internals of how that thing is built. So internally you can then iterate really quickly. So it turns out that Netflix was already organized in these small cells, because that was the way we found was the best way to organize. And when you build software in small cells, you end up building services. And those services talk to each other. And it turns out this is called microservices now. <laughs> but at the time, it was just the way we, it made sense to us to build this architecture. And so that's well, one of the problems I see with um, large enterprises is that they try to get into this architecture without forming these small cells. So you sometimes see people that will form a dev, I mean, we have these separate siloed teams. We have, we have the ad, this admin team, the developer team, and the UX team, and the product team, and they're all in different buildings and scattered around the world. We need to go to DevOps, so we'll create a DevOps team and we'll put them here. And this is not solving the problem. You're just creating yet another step. The right way to do this is to combine people from all of the organizations into one team that owns everything and can deliver that thing and owns the evolution of that thing. And we were going off this phrase from 2006 from Werner Vogels, you built it, you run it. Because if you're changing something really fast, like 10 times a day, 100 times a day, you don't have time to have meetings with operations about how to run it. You can't do that 10 times a day. Right? That works if you're releasing every few weeks or every few months. But if you're, really, if you're changing something really quickly, the person who should be on call for it is the last person that changed it, typically. Right? You might want to occasionally like, go on vacation or something, or, or have at least somebody else that knows about it. But then this is now getting into systems thinking. Right? If you make people responsible for their code and on call for it, that feedback loop is a system systemic feedback loop that makes people write really reliable code and they don't change stuff on Fridays and they don't check code in at 4 p.m. <laughs> right? Because they're going to be on call for it and if it breaks that night, right? So t you typically make changes in the morning, spend the afternoon debugging it if you need it, you get to sleep at night, things work fine. And it's a systemic feedback that causes people to have the right behaviors. So that's, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, so if we're building these applications and we've figured out how to organize ourselves in these small groups and we've figured out how to break our application up into pieces, then quite often we're trying to make mi migrations from the old way we did things where you had a, a monolithic application. Because, and the reason we start, had a monolith was we started with something small, which is it's worth having. You know, if you want to build something really quickly and there's only two or three of you to build it, you should start with something like Ruby on Rails with lots of scaffolding where all the, everything is defaulted. You just go and you start building it. You know, that afternoon you'll have a working website. 
that's that's what Ruby on Rails or or things like that do. But it's a monolithic site. It's a it's a web front end and a database, and they're very intimately tied together. So once you've got that environment, then you want to grow a bit, and then eventually you no longer fit in a room. And but the system gets bigger and bigger and slower and slower and harder and harder to modify. And that's the path a lot of people have been on over the last ten years or so. The reason, one of the reasons for this is that it used to be hard to deploy things. Like, go back 10 years, you need a database. How, how, how hard was it to get a database? Or go talk to a company. Like, let's talk to IBM or HP or Sun or somebody. We need a database. We, we talk to EMC about some disks, right? So, you know, six months later, you finally decided how to spend your million dollars or whatever it was on a big pile of disks and a big machine and, and an Oracle license, right? And... This is a painful process. So once you've got a database, every time you need to store, put data somewhere, you put data in that database. So you end up with a, a schema, database schema, that looks like a kitchen sink. It's just got piles of stuff in it because you only have one kitchen sink. <laughs> so all the dirty stuff washing goes in it. All the, all, right? the situation now is you can create a database in a... I don't know, a second, less than a second. You know, you just open a new domain on, on DynamoDB or you say, please provision me an RDS instance on AWS or, or any of the public clouds. Or you have tooling on OpenStack that will just start up another MySQL for you. So it's trivial to start a new database. And one of the most important architectural things you'll do, you should do is make it easy to do that and make it easy for developers to do that themselves, self-service then they won't create a kitchen sink because they can put everything that should be together together and they can put things that don't belong together in separate places. So when we did this transition at Netflix, we went from one big Oracle backend or like two or three heavily linked backends to eventually over a hundred different Cassandra clusters. <laughs> uh, every cluster doing one thing with an API in front of it and everything basically um, running off of that. So. How do you get between these two? And you've got this big monolithic thing, and how do you deal with that? And the other problem people go is, well, the monolithic app, you know, this microservices thing looks much more complicated. But when you look inside a monolithic app, it's horribly complicated, because it's talking to this, this schema that's a kitchen sink behind. So you've got a monolithic database that's a big mess. You've got your code in front of it that's a big mess. But when you draw your architecture, it's just one box, so it looks simple. Right? And it's got lots of APIs into it. Once you try and break that apart into microservices, you actually, if that's, if, if that's hard, then you know that the system was overly tied together. But once you get to microservices, the microservices themselves enforce a separation. And it looks more complicated on the diagram, but it's actually simpler because you've got clean boundaries. And you have things aren't reaching around those boundaries. You can see them reaching around. So I have a diagram. This is from a simulator that I built. Um, this is a microservices architecture for doing Internet of Things. Um, that I, I did this for a React conference. But basically, it's got you know three different endpoints. It's got a multi-region um, cluster for doing time series analytics, and it's got a couple of small um, clusters. And it's a multi-region system. This would be running on you know, Europe and the US or something like that. So you could put this up on a public cloud. You could start this up in a few minutes. You could scale it. You could just increase the number of machines in it to be as big as it needs to be. And if you look at a lot of uh, Internet of Things backends, they look something like this, right? There's a, an in, a endpoint where your thermostat is saying this is the current temperature. And there's a stream endpoint where your phone is telling you what the current temperature is. And there's an analytics endpoint that once a month tells you an email saying this is how much money, you, you know, energy you saved this month. That kind of thing. It was very generic. Um, this is, if you want to sort of follow the, or we'll talk about this program, it's a simulator for building microservices architectures where every microservice is simulated by a Go routine in memory. Um, every connection between a microservice is done using a Go channel is just in memory, and I can run maybe 100,000 microservices on my laptop at about 1,000 times faster than in the real world. Right? So the nice thing about simulators is that they, 
they, they don't simulate everything in the real world, they simulate interesting things about the real world. So if you want to sort of lay out what your architecture looks like and play around with new architectures and see if your tooling can visualize them, uh, that's kind of what this is aimed at. If you just follow Simeon Viz on Twitter if you want to get updates on it as changes happen. So, what I've been talking about so far is taking things that are complicated and making them simple, organizing your work so that it stays simple, or way, ways that you can organize yourself that avoid some of the complexity, but, also, but really about building e organizations that know how to evolve and products that know how to evolve. Because that's how you stay competitive nowadays. You need to be able to go fast in your competition. And if you think about this from an architecture point of view, like the microservices architecture, what we're really looking for is symmetry. That previous diagram is extremely symmetric. It's exactly the same in every zone and in every region and in every, um, every service is the same as every other service. So if I want to go to one of my node services, it's the same as the other node services, so I can just fail over to it. So that makes it simple. If I'm dealing with parts of the system, I know the other parts of the system are exact copies. They're built off the same image, the same container, or the same AMI. So there are all these invariants I can apply. That's how you get simplicity into your architecture. As soon as somebody says, hey, if we do this special case thing, it'll be a little bit more efficient, but it'll be different to everyone else. You go, well, but the, you're externalizing the cost of being different. For a little bit of efficiency, you're creating a, a lot of complexity, which will end up costing you something. So you want to be able to make strong assertions across your system. The assertions, these are all the same. I can switch all my traffic from one region to another and just keep running. That's the way Netflix runs today. They can, in fact, they, once a month they take all their traffic from Europe and they switch it from Dublin to Virginia just to make sure that they can. And they switch all the traffic from Virginia to Europe or to, or to Oregon. They, they're running in three regions. And any customer can be served from any region at any time. And you think, well, that's a little inefficient. Why is all my, everything I watch in Sweden being stored in Oregon? <laughs> right? Well, it's just it's simplicity that lets them do it. And this systems thinking approach. So this is uh, my so final quote. There's another quote from, from Jamshid in the systems thinking book. We see the world as increasingly more complex and chaotic because we are using inadequate concepts to explain it. When you understand something, you no longer see it as chaotic or complex. Right. So hopefully that helps you think about the systems you're building and uh, figure out ways to make them more simple. So that's it from me. Um, I'm just about out of time. We've got reminders to engage and win prizes and use the app, and I'll take a few questions. So uh, we have two questions. Uh, the first one is, what do you do if you're stuck in a medium-sized company with poor culture that is centered around managerial control? Um, <laughs> there's, quit. <laughs> there's a cup. There's a cup. Well, no. You, well, before you quit <laughs> and form your own company. <laughs> There's, there's a couple of books which are really useful um, for, for this. One is called The Phoenix Project by Gene Kim, and it's a novel about a company that's a medium-sized company that can't figure out how to do software, and it's about to go out of business and have its entire IT department outsourced. And it's based on a book called The Goal from about 30 years ago, which some, if you ever did an MBA or you know, those, one of those business books. So it's a similar kind of book. It talks about it drops, the, the, the book opens with a guy driving to work, he gets a call, uh, his, the CIO and the VP of operations have both quit, He's now the, and, and he should go v visit the CEO when he gets to work, and he's just like a manager or director in operations, and he doesn't want the job, and he doesn't want to have to fix it, but he gets dropped into fixing this problem. Uh, and it brings in a bunch of the principles that DevOps of, you know, whole Kanban boards and cars and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of little Japanese phrases start popping up. But the story is about how they solve the real problem. Um, Target, the, the uh, big retailer in the US, the 
uh, one of the operations guys, bought 20 copies of this book, gave it to all his managers, gave it to all his reports, and sort of play-acted scenes from it to get people to really understand it. So that's, that's one way you can perhaps influence. Um, there's another book, if, if you're trying to understand, uh, it's a book called The Art of Business Value. It's by Mark Schwartz. And Mark Schwartz is CIO of the Department of Homeland Security Immigration Service. So when you ever need to get a green card or a visa to go to America, it's the group that does that, all the immigration work. And it, he's running inside in, like, the world's biggest bureaucracy. And he's, and he's saying, where is the business value in a bureaucracy? And it's an extremely lighthearted, easy read book which goes through, like, well, the agile, agile, we're optimizing for business value, right? Well, what is the business value? No one really defined it properly. So he's trying to figure out this sort of an exploration of where you find the business value. And if somewhere along the way, he finds the business value in the bureaucracy. What is this really about? So it's a those, couple of books. If those don't work, you know, go start a company. Good. We have one more, <laughs> we have one more minute for the yeah. uh, last question. Uh, what recommendations would you make for companies who need to modernize and break apart their monoliths, but simply are not allowed or able to use the public cloud infrastructure? Um, so public cloud just saves you a bunch of time and effort for having to run things yourself. But what, what really matters about cloud is that it should be self-service. Right, and API driven, and then you get the automation, then you get the developer driven infrastructure. And you can do that with on-premise cloud, you can do it with OpenStack or Mesos or whatever, right? There are products from lots of companies that will automate your data center into a system that be becomes self-service and API driven. The difference with public cloud versus private cloud is when you stop using it, you stop paying for it. So it's much more about the economic incentive to build systems that auto scale and are really cloud native is different. Like in your, pub, in your private cloud, you don't get money back when you, I mean, unless you do internal billing, I guess, but the company doesn't pay less if you have idle machines, right? You still have the machines. On the public cloud, there's a strong incentive to build highly auto scaled systems that shut stuff down when they're not being used and you can get an enormous amount of efficiency out of that. So Like the, if, I mean, we're about to hear about AWS Lambda. What is the average utilization of a machine built with Lambda, an app built with Lambda? It's 100%. It's, or it's not running. It's not there, or it's 100% busy. What's the uptime? Well, most of the time it's not there, <laughs> or it's there, right? So it's sort of 100% utilization, 100% uptime, you're not running a machine. Um, I think the serverless architectures are, are really one of the most interesting new things and uh, it's coming up next. I agree. So. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Adrian.